I looked on YouTube, you know, just to see what information there was for like the mite of QC mice, for example, and I didn't really see anything. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, you know, is, this is something, a question that we get all the time, you know, these, these tools are so interesting and so fascinating. Uh, the, the way that they're developed, the, the, the you know, uh, the data that they provide you with. So we sort of thought, you know, this would be a good thing to get out. And maybe we can start right with that is the, the Mito QC, uh, what was kind of the story behind you guys developing it? I know we were obviously, you know, we have compounds that modulate this mitophagy process. So we were excited that there were tools already available when we, you know, went to, to measure, but curious how it started on your side. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the thing, you know, the, there was a real lack of tools to measure, you know, specific autophagy pathways in general. So there were kind of probably two main reasons why we came up with this, this, this MitoQC model. And, and the first, the first reason was in, in cell lines, if you didn't, you know, prime the pathway with parking overexpression and mitochondrial depolarization, it kind of, it was, we find it very hard to measure the amount of mitophagy going on by the classic methods of the day, which was, you know, Western blot or co-localization between mitochondria and lysosomes. It was, it was really hard to get anything reliable. And I think the upshot was that in general, cells don't want to do a lot of mitophagy. They want to keep all their mitochondria. So we, we, we kind of realized, well, we probably need a very sensitive way to look at this process because under normal conditions, cells probably aren't doing, doing a lot of it. And kind of the, the the second reason we 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 came up with this and, and, and the mouse model in particular was because I was I started going to mitochondrial meetings because I was an autophagy person didn't really understand a lot about 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 mitochondria and I, I was I was at one meeting and 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 somebody uh, was presenting some data on this this you know the the, the parking pathway and uh, I remember some of the questioning after after this talk it was a little bit robust kind of thing. Uh, you know, and the question is, well, how physiological is this process? Because, you know, we have to use the, these non-physiological conditions to look at it easily, you know, in cell lines. Is this really going on? And that kind of, I was sitting in the audience and it got me thinking a little bit, well, you know, am I working on, a, on an artificial pathway or is it, you know, is it a real pathway kind of thing? And at the time, we just didn't know that. Is mitophagy going on in all of our cells and all of our tissues all the time, or is it a really rare event? And we, we had no idea. So kind of this spurred us on to try and come, you know, try and find a, a sensitive assay. And uh, you know, mitophagy really is a physiological process and it, it is going on in, in most of our cells uh, a lot of the time, kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah, and and I remember that. I remember people kind of arguing that this mitophagy process is not real. And I obviously now there's so much evidence suggesting that it is real and it's physiological that that it uh it has put that to bed so thanks for developing the tools that really actually allow that because and we we do the same you know we see so many people in the field using overexpression models and really do have to question the relevance and sometimes yeah. they you know there isn't really relevance but yeah. you mentioned the you know the the level of mitophagy and particularly basal mitophagy um one thing that we have noticed, and I'm, I, you have alluded to in your papers as well, is that it's different in different tissues, right? Can we talk about that a little bit? You know, obviously we're interested in Parkinson's disease, work, so we're interested in brain, but we know there are a lot of other energetically demanding tissues. I know you've looked at skeletal muscle, we're looking at heart. Uh, you know, what have you seen as far as kind of the differences between how the, the various different tissues, and then even within the brain, maybe are, are you seeing differences in different regions? Yeah, you know, we, we, we certainly do. It, and it's, it's not, I mean, what, what's nice about these models is they, they've, you know, allowed us to look across different tissues, you know, under the same conditions. And, and, you know, even from the basics, you know, the rates of mitophagy that we see, it doesn't necessarily depend on mitochondrial content. For example, you know, if you have have a lot of mitochondria does that mean you have more mitophagy and and, and it doesn't you know we, we, we see this i mean in the kidney there are some of these like the distal convoluted tubules they're packed full of mitochondria yet there's hardly any mitophagy and then you have these other ones like the, like like the proximal tubules they have a lot of mitochondria too but they're doing loads of 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 of, of mitophagy and 
it tends to be a correlation between you know how classically energetic are these cells if, if they're you know the, the, these classically you know metabolically really active cell types skeletal muscle neurons you do tend to see a reasonable amount of mitophagy there but i think you know kind of one of one of the problems is well what is all this mitophagy why are the cells doing this mitophagy is it a damage response or is it more of a metabolic response you know i think i think that's classically people see autophagy as this is a way of getting rid of damaged things mm -hmm. but I think what's coming to light now is that, well, actually, it can change the metabolic context, you know, especially with, with mitophagy. Right, right. And that's a very important side. I do want to come back to that. But before we go there, um, you've mentioned and your background is, is autophagy as well. So that's the other question is, you know, you, you sort of were expecting if, uh, if it's just kind of damage removal, um, well, and initially, you know, when we didn't know that it was so specified to mitochondria, you, you sort of you know, wonder about the relationship between autophagy and general autophagy and mitophagy, you know, do we see, is it like the same cells that have more autophagy have more mitophagy? And I think the answer to that also is not necessarily, right? Have no. you guys? Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah, because I mean, what we did as well, at the same time we made the MitoQC mouse, we also made the AutoQC mouse kind of thing. And this is, the mice are virtually identical, it's about a hundred or so amino acids, but in, in the autophagy mouse, the AutoQC mouse, the tandem tag is attached to LC3. I think in general, what they've said, what they show is that there's a lot of autophagy in general going on, very high rates, whereas mitophagy, the relative amounts of mitophagy, they're very low compared to all these other autophagy pathways uh, that, that, that are going on. Which sort of makes sense, I think, you know, if you think about it and uh, you know, breaking down a mitochondria must be very expensive for the cell, right? So I would imagine that the cells try not to, not to do it yeah. if they don't need to for some, you know, whether it's for metabolic reasons or for damage repair reasons. And on that too, you know, we think about, I think, I hope one thing that everybody sees now is how kind of specialized these pathways are, that this kind of idea that we were maybe taught in graduate school of, you know, you have this general autophagy and it just clears everything in the cell, isn't, it's not that simple, right? There are specialized, and, and I hope this is how it's being taught now, at these specialized things. And this is all very new, right? This is all very recent that, that we've learned all of this. I th well, I think this is turning out to be a very key path. Way. you know I think it, it has been underappreciated I mean we, we, we've known about it for a while but you know it, it's I think it's, it's quite difficult to study but like you say this kind of a small scale turnover of very select components of of, of mitochondria is probably one from a from a uh, an energetic biological approach it's probably much more efficient to do things this way rather than getting rid of everything in in uh, in one go. So my feeling is it, it's probably a very critical, you know, quality control pathway for for, for mitochondria. And, um, uh, we skipped over and I kind of wanted to go back to was these MitoQC. Uh, there are a couple of other tools as well. And from our perspective, it's great. It's fantastic that there are multiple types of tools. So I know there's, you know, a little bit of competition there, but um, frankly, from the field's perspective, it's just really nice to have multiple different uh, oh, types of exactly. tools. You know, but I think, I think it's good for everybody to understand kind of the differences and, and you know, where maybe one would be better versus mm -hmm. the other. I know obviously mm -hmm. a major advantage of the MitoQC is being able to fix the tissue, right? So you yeah. can look at. I think, I, think, I think that's it. And I mean, at least in our hands, the reporters appear to show pretty much the same thing, which I think is nice. It gives you gives you confidence in 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 what what you're looking at is is real. You know, I think the main difference is the localization of the reporter. I think do you want it on the outer mitochondrial membrane or the inner inside the matrix targeted? Uh, so that's that's a difference, you know, obviously mitochima is, is localized to the matrix. I mean, I think the mitochima is very good and it gives a very good bright signal. Uh, and uh, uh, that can be quite advantageous. It works well live signaling and it's, it's you know, it, it's a relatively small molecule compared to a tandem M cherry GFP tag. You know, it's half, approximately half the size. So if you want to go inside the mitochondria, then I think it's good. I mean, we were worried when we had the tandem M cherry GFP that's quite big. And I think in general, it's getting across into the mitochondria can be quite rate limiting. Mm -hmm.
But the nice thing about Amadi QC is it's a binary signal. You know, it's it's either red and green or it's red only. You know, it's it's just this 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 simple binary signal, and it can be fixed. So, you know, you can then look in tissues. You know, section tissues and looking for for specific sub, sub you know cell, cell types. But if you don't need to do it in fixed tissue, you know, if you're just looking in cells, then then uh, all of these reporters are pretty are pretty Either good. Moment. So this has been great talking about what we have so far. Let's talk a little bit about the future of the field, where we kind of see things are going. I'm eager to hear, you know, where do you see the field in three years, five years, ten years, whatever down the road. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think one of the, at least for the mitophagy field, not, not necessarily for the, for the, or definitely not for the mitochondrial field, but one area I think that, that, that needs more looking into and, and that we will start to, to get more information is, is actually more this metabolic link that, 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 that we, we touched on earlier. And I think the role of metabolites in regulating this process, I mean, we've always been focused on the proteins, you know, what are the genes, then what are the proteins and how do they regulate this process? But I think what's coming to light is, is that, that, that metabolism is actually key in control of this. And of course, the metabolites, how they are sensed and this regulates the whole process. So I think there's going to be a big move towards this, you know, small molecule metabolites, are they regulating the process? And you think about the bioenergetics, you know, especially in neurons, it's so different compared to, to, to other cells. How is this then influencing mitochondrial turnover? Because the two are definitely very closely linked, metabolism and mitochondrial turnover. Yet how that's regulated, I think, you know, very, very little about kind of thing. So I think mm -hmm. this is going to be the next big area that, 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 that we're certainly getting interested in that. I'm sure a lot of other people, a lot of other people are. Anything that you think kind of falls to the top of the list as far as challenges that are holding the field back? I think, you know, it's, you know, what one of the things that, that, that that's driving, you know, research in general now are these kind of large scale screens, these omic studies, you know, like you say, from the GWAS studies and what have you, and these, and these, you know, big large scale proteomic screens, they're really bringing up really interesting associations. But I think we're still lacking that, that resolution, you know, these are very large scale. So I think it's going to be a big challenge in the field now to drill down can we do the same thing, but on a much smaller cellular scale? You know, this thing on single cell proteomics, I think, is you know going to be a buzzword coming 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 soon. Completely agree on that as well. And our team is doing, you know, we have a computational side as well, and they're they're doing a lot of kind of deciphering the different types of data, um, including proteomic data. Although I have to say, the proteomic data is kind of the most um, challenging because you mm. it. As you know, it's, uh, you know, a lot of times it's just easier to grab transcriptomic data, which of course then, you know, you have to, you have the caveat of transcriptomic data is yeah. not proteomic data. Um, but yeah, we, we're definitely looking at that. And I know you guys, you know, with the mass spec group there mm -hmm. and the proteomics group, it's, uh, we're excited to see what comes out and, and we have some, some experiments coming up. So very excited to, to see all of that.